All right. So now I'm going to start with our introductions of our featured speakers today, starting with Dr. Heather Walsh with the United States Geological Survey. Dr. Walsh is focused on developing molecular techniques to better understand mechanisms associated with disease in wild fish. To serve this purpose, she has developed her skills in histopathology, in situ hybridization techniques, and laser capture, laser capture microdissection. The use of these techniques has helped to understand disease observed during fish health assessments conducted in the Great Lakes and Chesapeake Bay, including the Susquehanna and Potomac River drainage. Much of her work has focused on fish, fish species uses indicators of environmental contamination, including smallmouth bass, which we're talking about today, brown bullhead catfish, white suckers, and yellow perch. And with that, I will allow Mark to say a little bit more about how we have worked together with USGS and Dr. Walsh on the small um, smallmouth bass health assessment. Mark? Yeah, um, our relationship with USGS goes all the way back almost 20 years. Um, when uh, the Shenandoah River first experienced a fish kill, a major fish kill, in the 2004-2005 time frame, uh, then Governor uh... Mark, you might have to repeat a bit of this or drop it in the chat because you're we're losing you a little bit. So Mark's got the Shenandoah Valley internet connection uh, going on right now. So Dr. Walsh, I think you can go ahead and start and we'll, we'll catch up on what all of that means um, maybe later. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about PFAS in the plasma of smallmouth bass and some of the associated health effects we've been finding. I'd like to thank my co-authors, uh, Cheyenne Smith, she's a PhD student at WVU, and she's been developing the immune function assays. Andrea Tokunov and Zach Hopkins are working our PFAS lab at the USGS, and then Vicki Blazer, who is my supervisor. And I just want to mention that this is pr preliminary information that has not yet been published, and it is subject to revision. So I what Mark was kind of going to mention was some of the background about why we've been studying smallmouth bass in the Potomac River drainage. As he mentioned, about almost two decades, we've been studying fish here in both the Potomac and the Shenandoah Rivers. They have experienced significant disease and mortalities throughout the years, some years worse than others. And what has been found during these times is that bass have been infected with different types of pathogenic bacteria different parasites and largemouth bass virus has been isolated. There has been no smoking gun or one cause associated with these disease events. And that has led us to believe that overall they have ca been causing um, immunosuppression in the fish, potentially leading to the mortality events. In some more recent years, we've started to see lower juvenile recruitment in some regions of the Potomac, which um, we initially saw stuff like that in the Susquehanna River drainage where they had a stable population and no fish kills of the adult smallmouth bass, but they were having trouble with the recruitment of juveniles. And now it seems to have come down our way and we still have yet to detect what might be causing that exactly. Um, over here in the picture of this, this is a smallmouth bass opened up and I have some arrows pointing to, these are little black spots um, called grubs or their type of parasite in the muscle and the skin. And then in the liver here, you see these little white specks, and those are a different type of grub that we find in the liver, spleen, and kidneys. This would be considered a high rate of infection, but we see varying degrees at different sites. So looking at the population over time, on the left, we have the South Branch Potomac River, and this was data provided by the West Virginia DNR. And this dates back to 2005. So you can see the population in the beginning of the um, fish kill mortality events. 
which was actually higher than what it has dropped down to in 2008. You saw an increase in 2010 and then steadily over time to 2018, I should say, it has decreased. But luckily in 2019, they started to see an increase in the populations again, which has remained stable over the past few years. And then in the main stem Potomac, this is data provided by the Maryland DNR. This graph shows two different um, population of the fish that are greater than 180 millimeters, which would be ages two to three year, year old, reproductively active, and then the age, the, age, the size class, I'm sorry, of 280 to 350 millimeters would be the size class of um, four-year-olds and older. And again, going back to 2013, you see a similar drop as you do in the South Branch into 2019, where it kind of stabilizes and then increases slightly again in 2022, which is always good news and is nice to see. All right, so jumping into the, the topic of PFAS. These are, I've listed here some of the sources of PFAS. Um, there's a lot more than just this, but these are some of the more um, uh, identified sources, and they include firefighting foam, industrial discharge, and biosolids and wastewater. So if you're not familiar with what biosolids are, these are a byproduct of wastewater treatment. It is the sludge that accumulates and then they need to find, these wastewater treatment plants need to find something to do with it. So the one of the solutions has been to apply these biosolids to agricultural fields as a fertilizer. So um, it's become a contentious topic because they're initially spreading PFAS all over the fields and it's getting into the food supply that way. PFAS is also found on fast food wrappers and nonstick cookware, in addition to furniture and carpets because it is a waterproofing agent. And more recently, it's been found in a number of pesticides. And one of the um, things that it does in pesticides is it, is it helps become, make the pesticides more stable. This is an image published in the Stack publication in 2023, and Stack is an advisory committee for the Chesapeake Bay program. I liked it because it shows you all of the ways that PFAS can potentially enter river systems and can be transported into through groundwater and into public drinking water. And as far as fish goes, we we do see that PFAS bioaccumulates. Um, through the fish populations. So we do see higher levels in predator, predatory fish as opposed to fish that just mainly eat plant foliage. And then again, the bioaccumulation goes up the food chain when humans eat them or birds. So similar to humans, PFAS has effects in fish, including decreased immune function and reproductive endocrine disruption. It can be carcinogenic to fish as well as humans. There are behavioral effects. Some studies have found that fish tend to reside more in shaded areas of the tank when they're exposed to PFAS or males are not as aggressive, which can also lead to reproductive um, changes. Gene expression and hormonal changes. I'll, I'll talk about some of the gene expression changes that we've seen but also these hormonal changes, again, can lead to reproductive effects. And also disruption in lipid homeostasis and cholesterol levels, uh, cholesterol levels in humans more so in fit than in fish. But with fish, um, lipid homeostasis is very important for a couple reasons, um, especially smallmouth bass. Male smallmouth bass are the ones that make the nests and then they guard the nest afterwards. And during that time, they don't eat very much. So they have to have enough lipid reserves in order to maintain themselves during that time. And then females utilize lipids with, for egg production. So it could have an impact on healthy eggs. Uh, the pictures shown here show where some states have issued fish consumption advisories due to PFOS levels being really high. Maryland is one state that has started being proactive in this area, but West Virginia and Virginia, to the best of my knowledge, have not. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk break my talk down into two types of health assessments that we have started doing. This is the first part is describing our routine health assessment. And this, the data I'm going to provide to you is from 2017 to 2019 from two sites in the Potomac drainage. One site along the South Branch Potomac River in Moorefield, West Virginia, and that's labeled on the map as SB3. And at that site, five PFAS facilities have been identified with GIS land use analysis. And then our second site is at the confluence of Antietam Creek and the main stem Potomac, which is labeled as MS5. And there, 25 PFAS facilities were identified in the upstream catchment from that site. In addition to these differences in PFAS, the number of PFAS facilities, there's also land use differences. The Antietam site, MS5, has a greater number of agricultural land use and developed land use as opposed to South Branch, which, which does have agricultural land use surrounding it, but it does also have more forests. So our fish health assessments consist of looking the fish over for any exter external abnormalities, and then we weigh and measure the fish in order to obtain the condition factor, which is a measure of health, is the fish growing at the rate it should be for its size, um, and then blood samples. We take the blood samples and we're able to extract the plasma for PFAS analysis, and then we perform the necropsy where we can remove the liver and we weigh it to get a hepatosomatic index, which is a measure of energy, tissues for histopathology to look at microscopically, and then liver for gene transcript abundance. And this includes 45 gene transcripts that are associated with oxidative stress, stress, immune function, reproductive function, and a few others. So by doing this, we, we can get a multi-level approach looking from the molecular level to the cellular level to the individual organismal level. And we can get a better idea about how these changes might be affecting the population. PFAS analysis was done by SGS Axis. We sent our samples off to um, Sydney, British Columbia, Canada. This, this service is used quite widely throughout the United States. And they identified, well, they analyzed for 13 different types of PFAS. And then when I get into the second part of our studies, which is the non-lethal health assessment, the PFAS for that assessment was analyzed by our USGS PFAS lab in Kernsville, West Virginia for 82 different types of PFAS. And both types of analyses use liquid chromatography um, tandem mass spec. All right, so jumping into the plasma PFAS results. So I provided the, the data also in parts per billion because I think some people relate more to that. Um, but it's also the concentration there is in nanograms per mil. So on the left, we have our Antietam Potomac main stem site. And on the right, we have the South Branch Potomac site. And right away, if you look at the y-axis, you can see that at the Antietam site, there are much higher levels than at the South Branch site. Remember, there were 25 PFAS facilities identified at Antietam and only five at South Branch Potomac. Um, there's definitely changes over time amongst the three years. At Antietam, you see PFDA, PFUNA, and PFDOA um, kind of spike in 2018 and drop down in 2019, but PFAS and total PFAS increase over time. That's similarly shown at the South Branch Potomac, but at the South Branch, PFASA was not detected and PFNA was not detected in 2017. And overall, the values of PFDA, PFUNA, and PFDOA were lower. So to look at some sources, contributing sources of PFAS, we can look at the total biosolid application in the upstream catchment, and then the pesticide application in the upstream catchment at both sites. And again, you'll see differences here. Um, the South Branch Potomac had a lot less total biosolid application, and this is the total nutrients from biosolids. And at Antietam, the levels got as high as 20,000 kilograms, whereas at the South Branch, they were about um, 1.93 kilograms. 
And for the pesticide application at Antietam, there was as high as over 200,000 kilograms, whereas at South Branch, it was only about, as high as about 50. So we definitely see some site differences here. And again, I'll mention that Antietam does have more agricultural and developed land cover. So looking at one of those immune function endpoints that Cheyenne Smith has developed, um, this is the bioassay for unstimulated background mitogenesis. And mitogenesis is the process of induction of mitosis in cells. So essentially it's cell production. And this act assay is essentially looking at the production of lymphocytes, so which is a type of white blood cell. At Antietam, so this data is showing the spring of um, from females and male fish at Antietam Creek, and you see a negative correlation indicating an impaired immune response. So as PFAS, total PFAS concentration increases, lymphocyte production decreases. Included here is our site from our Susquehanna sampling, the West Branch Mahantango Creek, which has similar land use and also higher levels of PFAS than some of the other sites we've sampled at. And it's interesting to see that at a couple sites, we're seeing the same immune response because with working with wild fish data, it varies so much from site to site. So when you see an immune response that's similar among sites with similar types of land use, it's pretty interesting and could be considered useful as a biomarker. While some of these are necessarily not significant, the rho value is still negative and um, does show a negative correlation. So these were some of the gene transcripts associated with PFAS. And what I want you to focus on, we have the, the, the tables are separated out by sexes. So on the, on the left are males and on the right are females with spring and fall separated. And you'll note that at, at Antietam, the number of genes was higher um, in the spring and fall for males, as opposed to when we look at females in the spring and fall, which don't have as many genes associated with PFAS um, in females. So there, again, this could be going back to the fact that males might be more sensitive to PFAS because they're coming into contact with it in a different route potentially maybe when they're spawning and coming into contact with the sediment. You'll note that the types of genes that are associated with PFAS in the spring include immune and inflammation related genes, reproductive related genes, and stress. So again, this goes back to the fact that these fish are being immunosuppressed during the spring at a time of spawning and may be contributing to the overall impact of the population. And then when we look at associations with biological endpoints, and these biological endpoints included size, the hepatosomatic index or HSI, um, the condition factor, and overall there was no associations with condition factor. So we did see though that size was positively associated with PFAS accumulation, but only in male fish. And then looking at um, the differences between SB3, which is the South Branch site, and MS5, which is the Antietam site, there were no significant correlations with biological endpoints in, in the female fish at Antietam. But at the South Branch, the hepatosomatic index was negatively associated with PFAS, four different types of PFAS. PFAS, PFAS, PFDA, PFUNA, and PFDOA. So what this could mean is that we're seeing this decrease in HSI associated with increases in PFAS. So the ratio of liver weight to body weight, which is a measure of energy, is being impacted. And as I mentioned earlier, this might have a this could impact fish at the time when they're spawning and um, have negative effects to their overall reproduction. All right, so I'm moving on now to our non-lethal sampling assessments. I conducted this with the Maryland DNR last fall at five sites along the main stem Potomac. Um, 
you can see my pointer. This includes number six on the map, which is Dargan. This is the same site where we had, I was talking about just a minute ago at the confluence of Antietam Creek and the main stem Potomac in Dargan, Maryland. And then moving upstream to Shepherdstown, Taylor's Landing, Williamsport, and McCoy's Ferry. And these sites are fairly close together. Our GIS analyst was able to identify catchments for each individual site so that we were able to tease apart um, land use applications and how they might be associated with the, our, find, our PFAS findings. So as opposed to our routine health assessments, which we euthanize the fish, for the non-lethal sampling, we're only sedating them. Maryland, because they're concerned with the decrease in the population of smallmouth bass, they didn't really want to euthanize any more fish for these studies. And so we developed this non-lethal sampling techniques where we can still analyze a suite of biological endpoints without actually killing the fish. So we sedate them, we can weigh and measure them, and then again, get condition factor. And then HAI stands for health assessment index, which I'll explain a little bit later. And then we are still able to take a sample of blood in order to analyze PFAS. And then I was also able to analyze multiple blood chemistry endpoints, including some different enzymes and proteins, and then do a blood smear. I don't have the data back for the blood smear yet, but it includes leukocyte counts, which are white blood cells, and then the different types of white blood cells that are present. Then also, we were still able to look at the immune function gene expression by taking a small clip of the gill lamellae, and then we take whole blood to look at immune function gene expression. Another thing I was able to do was do a skin swab for the microbiome. I just sent, sent those samples off yesterday, so I don't have the data back for that yet either. But essentially, what this is, is looking at the different microbial and fungal communities at each site, and we'll be able to compare how those are different amongst the five sites. So these are the results of the PFAS in the plasma of the fish from these five sites. I only sampled 10 fish at each site. This was kind of a preliminary uh, study just to see, are we gonna be able to find things doing this type of non-lethal sampling? And so you'll notice that Taylor's Landing had the highest levels of these different, these six different PFAS, um, including the PFDA, PFUNA, and PFDOA. And I mentioned those because they were found in every fish from this study and every fish from that routine health assessment part that I was talking about at first. And then the other four sites were fairly similar with concentrations, um, but the different types of PFAS did vary. I, I initially thought that anti our Antietam site was going to probably be the highest because when we looked at that and compared it to the sites where we've sampled in the Susquehanna River drainage and the South Branch sites, we have more sites than the, just the SB3 site that I was talking about it's always the highest. So to see it in perspective to, uh, compared to other sites within the Potomac was interesting to see that it is actually not the highest levels. And then looking at the big ones, PFAS and then total PFAS, PFAS. Obviously PFAS makes up the most of what the total PFAS concentrations end up being. But again, the fish at Taylor's Landing had the highest levels followed by the fish at Shepherdstown. And I didn't, I didn't show the data here, but the fish at Shepherdstown were the, were the smallest fish that we sampled. They were not able to find very big fish there that were comparable in size to the other four sites. So we made do with what we could get. And the fish were a lot smaller at Shepherdstown. They were probably within the age range of two and maybe three years old. Whereas at the other sites, I would guess that the ages were between four and maybe six or even older. So we do see to, tend to see PFAS bioaccumulate. And as I showed you earlier, size of fish does matter. We saw higher levels in um, of PFAS in larger male fish, but here we're seeing 
higher levels in these smaller fish. And when you look at the table on the left, the fact that Shepherdstown has the least amount of PFAS facilities, the lowest amount of biosolid application and pesticide application in the upstream catchments, it's hard to associate with what's going on here. So my best guess is that there's some other source of PFAS in the drainage around our Shepherdstown site that is contributing to these levels. Um, I'm gonna go back a slide because these six PFAS were not necessarily much higher than at the other sites. So it's PFAS here that is definitely driving the total PFAS at Shepherdstown. But we can, it is kind of helpful to explain what's going on at Taylor's Landing by looking at these land applica applications because they, that site did have the greatest number of PFAS facilities, biosol application and pesticide application. Um, the, this data for pesticide application, I should note, is from 2019. And then McCoy's Ferry came in second after Taylor's Landing. Okay, so I, I mentioned I would explain what the health assessment index is. So we're able to look at the fins and body surface and the gills and then come up with a rating of the abnormalities that we are seeing. So parasites generally get, we give them a value of 10, and then the ulcers and lesions, um, and then different types of abnormalities like related to ulcers and lesions in the gills are also scored higher. These tend to have more of a health effect on the fish than do the parasites. Because as I mentioned earlier, we see parasites at almost all of the sites where we sample at, and it doesn't necessarily mean they have a negative health effect. Um, but looking at this, so Shepherdstown makes sense because as I mentioned, they were younger fish and we tend to see a lower rate of these indices in younger fish. They haven't been expo exposed to as much and they don't have as many parasites or anything yet being since they're younger, that's like the older fish do. But McCoy's Ferry, um, here we see a higher level of the gill HAI. And when I look back at the data, that was mostly associated with gill erosions. So um, not necessarily saying that it's associated with PFAS. I have to dig into the data a little bit more. But when we see that these, we have higher levels here at Taylor's Landing and McCoy's Ferry, the skin and the gill are a fish's first line of defense um, against infections. So when we see higher levels at some of these sites, particularly Taylor's Landing, where we are seeing evidence of immune suppression, it can exacerbate those types of effects. I know this table is busy, but it's pretty easily summed up. So these are the immune function genes that I analyzed in the gills. And as I mentioned, I also analyzed them in the blood. I did not provide the blood data because I didn't really see many differences between the sites. But if you look at Taylor's Landing, these immune function genes the green means they're down-regulated and the red means they're higher counts or up-regulated. You can see at Taylor's Landing, there's so many more down-regulated genes than at the other four sites. Shepherdstown's kind of intermediate for that set of genes, but um, definitely Taylor's Landing stood out. I'm gonna work on this a little bit more to see how I can tease out and how it relates to how these individual genes relate to PFAS directly and which types of PFAS they are correlating with. So another one was um, the enzyme in the blood, plasma and creatine kinase. Creatine kinase is an intracellular enzyme present in skeletal muscle. It's an indicator of skeletal muscle damage in fish and can indicate drug or contaminant exposure. In 2020, there was a study on striped bass and they found an increased uh, creatine kinase level associated with PFAS. And at Taylor's Landing, we found the highest levels. So again, the high levels of PFAS associated with higher levels of creatine kinase. And I wanted to include this slide because even though it's not within the Potomac drainage, people often wonder what is the tissue distribution and how does plasma compare to muscle, which would be a, um, a cause of concern for human consumption. So these are largemouth bass from Ashimut Pond in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. 
And this pond is, um, is next to the Cape Cod Joint Base military compound where military compounds are definitely associated with PFAS emissions. And just to put it all in perspective, so the EPA drinking water health advisory is 0.02 parts per trillion for PFOS. So what I have here are the PFOS levels in muscle, liver, and plasma. At the Ashimut Pond, the average muscle concentration was 164,000 parts per trillion, which is roughly 28 times lower than in the plasma shown here. The closest health consumption fish consumption advisory I could find was from Maryland at Piscataway Creek, which is next to Joint Base Andrews. The largemouth bass sampled there had about 94,000 parts per trillion in the mussel, and the consumption advisory was issued to be three meals a month, although there, it is a somewhat controversial because that seems rather high. But then relating it to the, the data I just showed you from the Potomac smallmouth bass, the average Potomac plasma concentrations was about 285 parts per trillion. So if you factor in that 28, that the plasma is 28 times higher than the muscle, you could estimate that muscle is about 10,000 parts per trillion for the fish at those five sites I showed you from the non-lethal sampling. And the take home message here today is that four PFAS were detected in every sample and they included PFOS, PFDA, PFUNA, and PFDOA. The suppression of immune function, energy, and muscle damage has been, was identified with reduced lymphocyte production, the suppression of immune function genes, lower hepatosomatic indices with higher levels of PFAS concentrations, and an increase in creatine kinase, which is the indicator of muscle damage. And also that PFAS distribution is highest in the plasma, intermediate in the liver, and lowest in the muscle when you comp compare the three. Some things we're gonna be working on in the future. Um, we have these immune-related genes that I showed you that we analyzed in the gill. We're gonna also be analyzing them in the anterior kidney which is the a main immune-related tissue within the fish. Um, we're gonna be performing in vitro and in vivo exposure studies to the four most detected PFAS that we have found, and then and trying to do environmentally relevant exposures is important. And then identify trends. We have other sample, we have other sites where we sample plasma PFAS. And then lastly, we're going to be determining levels in the young of the year to see how those are. Of course, um, none of this work is possible without our commitment from the state agencies, including the West Virginia and Maryland DNR, and then our histotechnician, Adam Sperry. And our funding came from the West Virginia DNR and West Virginia Co-op Fish and Wildlife Research Unit and the USGS Ecosystems Mission Area. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Walsh. Um, I'm gonna start with questions that were submitted ahead of time, if that's all right. Um, we've got one question about, um, more elaboration about PFAS and hormone or endocrine disruption in fish and how that might be different species-wise. Um, do you have more to say about that? We in the smallmouth bass that we've looked at our reproductive endpoints like intersects, they might be questioning. Um, we had and our reproductive related genes, we haven't seen a whole lot. We have seen some associations with plasma vitelogenin in the females. And if you're not familiar with plasma vitelogenin is, it's an egg yolk precursor protein. So I think also some of our future studies should include more gene expression in the females going moving forward. We don't necessarily see a whole lot of um, changes at the cellular level, but maybe we're missing something at the molecular level. Thank you for that answer. Uh, second question about species difference in PFAS con concentration in the fish mu muscle or fish tissue rather than um, the blood samples. Yeah. So. Um, I, I mentioned in that one slide a couple slides ago 
looking at the Ashimut largemouth bass and trying to compare them to what we found in the Potomac River smallmouth bass. Um, it's really important to keep species in mind because uh, some of the studies have found that smallmouth bass actually tend to have higher levels in the muscle than largemouth bass. So that number that I estimated about 10,000 parts per trillion could be underestimated for smallmouth bass. It was just an, a, to give you an idea of, of what it might be around. Um, and centrarchids in general, which include the sunfish and the bass, tend to have higher levels than in such species like catfish. So definitely depends and it's important to consider. Thanks. Um, Mark, if you're back, would you like to now say some more about the smallmouth bass health assessment? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm keeping my screen off. I have a face radio anyway, so um, I would, I'll just keep it that so I can stay online. Um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, we had this long, we, we have a, a real long relationship with, with uh, USGS and um, uh, about back in 2019, we started the smallmouth bass health assessment and started looking at smallmouth bass populations in major Chesapeake watersheds, the, the James, the Shenandoah, the Potomac and Upper Potomac and, and the Susquehanna uh, fishery as well. And uh, we've been working with uh, Dr. Vicki Blazer and Dr. Walsh and, and um, this past March, we had our uh, 2023 smallmouth bass ass health assessment um, up at the Eastern Ecological Science Center, the USGS facility in, in, in Kearneysville. Um, and and um, the director there, Tom O'Connell, could not have been uh, more helpful in assisting us. And so we just have a really good uh, relationship. And in addition to all the PFAS work that Dr. Walsh has mentioned, they're also doing a tremendous amount of work just on the overall health of smallmouth bass and um, the presence of intersex fish and endocrine disruptors. Um, and so there's a whole other, um, you know, it, whole other areas of research that's going on. And um, I, I just want to thank Dr. Walsh and, and, and Dr. Blazer for the work that they do. Um, on a purely selfish note, um, how would we go about getting funding so USGS could also be looking at uh, some of the smallmouth bass and the and the Shenandoah watershed. I mean, is it just dependent upon funding sources for where you guys do your your research? And um, any insight on that? That would be great. Uh, yes, yes, it sort of has been um, because we're looking at plasma. One way we've been able to leverage previous studies with now looking at PFAS that we got some funding to, to do is that we had these plasma samples just sitting in the freezer from some of our previous sampling events. So we were able just to pull that out and send it off to get analyzed. Um, we hadn't really been doing many fish health assessments down in the Susquehanna um, in the past several years. So we, we didn't really have anything to include for that. Um, but we are starting to work with them more. They're collecting some young of the year fish for us. And, you know, hopefully that leads to, you know, future health assessments down there. And then we're, I, I can definitely speak for Vicki. She's really clever at finding ways to leverage funding. So uh, it would be nice to expand our horizons down into the Shenandoah some more. Mark, while we're on it, I think there are some questions in here that are uh, more aimed towards you. One is, how can PFAS be measured or tested for on a budget? Okay, Mark, we can come back to that one. There were more in the chat. Um, oh, Mark, you here? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I'm not certain why I I, I bounce like that. Um, we, we we did two samples um, with funding that we received from Waterkeeper Alliance. 
um, the two samples that we did uh, were above and below the Merck pharmaceutical plant in the South Fork of the Shenandoah. Um, and we actually found that the PFAS level below the Merck uh, pharmaceutical plant was lower than the sample grab from upstream um, on that. Um, you know, testing for PFAS, you know, if you want to do thorough testing, it's just expensive and you need to find funding sources to make that happen. It's, it's difficult to do it on the, on the cheap. It's not like you can do a macro invertebrate assessment and get a quick feel of the health of the river condition. Um, you, you need real funding. Yeah, um, from the fish part of that, it's about to send it off to SGSX, it's, a, it's about $500 a sample. Now that we have the USGS lab, um, they, they get funded to do PFAS, but they're very busy. So it's hard to work in samples right now. But um, yeah, it, I assume probably water samples that like would be really thorough would also probably be about close to $500, I think. There's another question in here on that. Um, if Dr. Walsh, if you measured in this study surface water PFAS concentrations at the sites? Unfortunately, we don't for all the sites. Because um, as I mentioned, a lot of this was pulling plasma out of the freezers that we had on hand to get the opportunity to analyze PFAS concentrations. So that moving forward, that's definitely something we need to and we want to start doing to see what the levels are in the water and how they relate to the levels in the fish. Thanks for that answer. Um, one more. So there was a question here about how PFAS facilities was defined in the study. They, that was our GIS analyst looked at those and they are GIS or their PFAS facilities identified by the EPA. So I do have a list of what exactly they are off the top of my head. I'm, I don't remember each one, but I do know it was, how they were determined by the EPA. It was definitely striking that in your one chart, there was one that had like 195 close to which, whichever tributary that was. So that yeah, was- I think that- think Wow. Taylor's Landing, yeah, it was really high. And these are just little catchments, you know? Mm -hmm. Serena, I see that John Mullican with the Maryland DNR raised his hand for a question. Go can. ahead, John. You can just come off mute. Yeah. All right. Uh, hi, Heather. Great presentation. Um, yeah. I had a question about the PFAS facilities. You answered part of that with those are determined by the EPA, but in the one table where you had the number of PFAS facilities in the catchment, and I think Taylor's Landing was high it was over 100 maybe 200 whatever it was but then it was zero at shepherdstown well taylor's landing is only i don't know seven to ten miles upstream of shepherdstown so how are the how is that catchment defined and wouldn't the ones uh in taylor's landing just upstream wouldn't they still be within the catchment at shepherdstown again this, our gis analyst defined those catchments for us. So I would have to look back at how she defined them exactly. And I do have all that information. So I can definitely follow up with you on that, John. Okay, thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, it is. it was interesting to me that there was so much, such a difference between those catchments because they are all so close to each other. Oh, I missed one of the chat questions. Um, so Frank asks, is there a correlation between the presence of parasites and PFAS? Are parasites something that are always present to some degree? They are always present to some degree. Um, I did see a couple associations with PFAS. I'd have to look back at my data and see what those were exactly because we, we do assess uh, parasite density in the liver and the spleen. And um, it differs by site. At some of the sites, actually PFAS was associated with, I think this was at Antietam, 
was associated with spleen macrophage aggregates, and these are another type of immune function endpoint. Macrophage aggregates are the destroyers of invaders within the body, and so they can help also wall off contaminants. Um, and we did see those associated with PFAS at Antietam, and then I think it was at South Branch that I did see a couple of correlations with liver parasites. Thanks for that answer. Any other questions um, you can just put in the chat or come off mute and go ahead and ask away. Dr. Walsh, Mark, again, I, um, I, I have one question in terms of, you, you know, we're looking at smallmouth bass and, and I'm just curious, could smallmouth bass be viewed um, a bit as a canary in a coal mine? And if you're seeing, um, you know, concerns in smallmouth bass, um, is that an indication of human beings going to be seeing, um, uh, you know, complications down the road um, with with liver and cancers and things of that nature uh, due to PFAS? And, it, you know, is would it be a lagging indicator or um, I, I'm just curious to try to make a connection between human health and fish health that we're seeing yeah. here in the river? Well, the way I can answer this is that they sort of are. They are definitely a sensitive species and they're more sensitive than largemouth bass. So as I mentioned that some studies have found higher PFAS levels in the muscle of smallmouth bass than largemouth bass. And when we look back at those fish kills a couple decades ago, it was mostly smallmouth bass. So they're definitely sensitive. And also when we go back to looking at intersects, the smallmouth bass have higher levels of intersex than largemouth bass. But then associating it to the human health, everybody, the intersex issue became a really huge idea. It became a really huge deal because these fish are living in the Potomac where people are drinking that water. Um, and did we, I, you know, I don't know if there was ever a point where they saw an increase in intersex humans or how that ever measured out. but. Um, so yes and no, I think, <laughs> is how I would answer that. Yes, they're definitely a sensitive indicator species overall. Great, thank you. Yeah, this is John again. Um, looking at the, the concentrations that you found in the smallmouth in the Potomac main stem, uh, I guess it's concerning that the Antietam site uh, uh, was so much higher than uh, the South Branch, and I guess either higher or comparable to one of the sites in the Upper Susquehanna. But is there other is there data out there? I guess national on a national level with smallmouth, um, and how would those compare with other? river systems outside the mid-Atlantic, mid or has that not even been looked at yet? Yeah, well, John, there's actually a really good paper that came out uh, beginning of the year, maybe, or a little after, where they did that. They looked at multiple river systems within the United States, and so they do have a lot of the, I'll send it to you, they have a lot of the concentrations that you're asking about in different species and how it compares, and I don't remember a small mouth, I think smallmouth bass was in there, but um, they did find, you know, it was kind of a scary um, result was that almost all the fish had some type of PFAS contamination. So, or, I mean, if anybody's interested in that paper, I can definitely share it with the participant, the participants on this call today, because it was, it was a pretty cool paper. Great, thank you. I definitely like like to see that. Yeah, we can send that out. Okay. There's another one that just came out by the USGS on PFAS and drinking water that I'll share too. Any other questions? I definitely learned something really tiny today, which is that PFAS is not pronounced the same as P. PFOS, P-F-O-S, <laughs> and I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky. <laughs> I always just called it P-F-O-S. Mm, yeah. Well, the PFAS is like them all collectively. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, I, I did have a question myself about that. So for the different types of PFASs, um, is there a way that they can be traced back to a certain product or a certain producer or a certain industry? Like, do we know what the different uses are? Some of them, I, I think they do. Um, that That is definitely something that we, would be interesting to know in our studies. We're not quite there yet. But yeah, I, I do. I'm pretty sure there are some studies where they're able to trace it back on some of the some of the different types. Interesting. Right, because PF, PF, PFOS, PFOS are firefighting foam. Yeah, and I mean, that's the one we see a lot at the highest concentration. So it must be in a lot more things than the other ones. Interesting. Yeah, a final follow-up on that then. What, what should we all be doing about this? <laughs> We're definitely all concerned. It's difficult because it's everywhere. That one grant that table or I'm sorry that graphic I showed you where it's like in the environment it's it's in the groundwater it's in a lot of things that we don't even it's in dental floss I mean it's unless something tells you that it's PFAS free you're kind of it's kind of like you know a crapshoot you don't know so just being aware of the sources I think would definitely be a good thing to keep in mind and I hate to say it, but like limiting fish consumption or knowing where the fish come from and if there's some type of consumption advisory warning or what, you know, if there's high levels in the area. Very helpful. Well, thank you to everybody who joined today. Um, I just put a link in the chat to some of our upcoming River Palooza paddle trips. And we hope that you'll be able to join us on um, the couple that are remaining for the end of the summer. We've got uh, excellent trips in the lineup. Papa Ben's uh, led by Brent Walls, our Upper Potomac River Keeper, and uh, Shenandoah Rafting at the end of August, which is always a ton of fun. So we hope you'll be able to come out for that. Um, and if you haven't joined us as a member already, join us as a member. That's $35 a year to support work like this um, in partnerships with uh, USGS, many others um, to do this work.